Alternative Radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone, everywhere. Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael. And in the three previous episodes, I've taken a look at the Second Battle of Adobe Walls that began on June 27, 1874. In the first, we pretty much just had a brief summary that you could get from any normal Texas history text or a reference book with a little bit extra. And in the next two, we took a deep look at the memories of someone that had been present, Billy Dixon. And in this episode, we're going to take an even closer look by using more sources and hearing from the Native American participants to get their point of view and their memories of the event. So let's travel back to May 1874 to visit a once mighty Comanche leader who had witnessed the decades of waning power of his people as he falls ill on Elk Creek in Indian Territory. For many years, the man had been a mighty warrior and provider for his people. To them, he was known as Para Okum. To the people pushing into his lands, he was known as He-Bear or Bull-Bear. The people, the Numina, as they called themselves, or Comanches as others knew them, were readying for war. After the Americans had ended fighting each other from 1861 to 1865, they had turned their focus back to their expansion westward. But the people and the other nations of the plains stood in the way. Delegates from the United States had brought thousands of them together near Medicine Lodge Creek in Kansas in late 1867. The people, the Numina, the Comanches, were there as were the Kiowa, the Arapaho, Kiowa Apache, and the Southern Cheyenne. The United States Indian Peace Commission negotiated three treaties there at Medicine Lodge Creek. One with the Kiowa and Comanche. The second treaty confederated the Plains Apaches, Kiowa Apaches, with the Kiowa and the Comanche. The third was with the Arapaho and Cheyenne. And the treaties were agreements in which the United States offered peace and protection from white encroachers on the people's lands if the tribes would be peaceful also and settle on reservations in western Indian territory. Pero Coombe, Bull Bear, was camped near Medicine Lodge Creek with his Quahati band, but he did not attend the councils, and he refused to consider signing any treaty. It's said that he repeatedly stated that he would consider following the white man's road when the horse soldiers came out and defeated him in battle on the plains. Now, riding in 1866, General Randolph B. Marcy had this to say of the people. There, meaning Comanche, government is essentially patriarchal, guided by wise and fraternal councils. They are insensible to the wants and luxuries of civilization and know neither poverty nor riches, vice or virtue, and are alike exempt from the deplorable vicissitudes of fortune. Theirs is a happy state of social equality, which knows not the perplexities of political ambition or the crimes of avarice. Now, in May of 1874, camped on Elk Creek, south of the Wichita Mountains in southwestern Indian Territory, the people were readying for war. Normally, Pero Coombe would have been involved. Instead, he was deathly ill with pneumonia. Instead, a younger generation was taking the helm. Two young men were especially active. One, a young prophet named Esate. The other, a young warrior, Quana, son of Peta Nocona and Cynthia Ann Parker, who had been taken from her Parker family in 1836 by the Comanches, and from her Comanche family by the Texans in 1860. Quana himself had been born about 1850, 
Some think possibly as early as 1845. We don't know, and Quanah himself wasn't sure. He speculated on the 1850 date later in life. And Isate was perhaps a little older. Now, with the completion of the Union Pacific Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, daring entrepreneurs like Billy Dixon, that we learned about in previous episodes, were able to kill and ship buffalo hides east for a profit. Now, another buffalo hunter, Josiah Wright Moore, had started hunting buffalo in the area of Dodge City after working cutting cordwood and killing buffalo for meat in 1870. He supplied the railroad crews with buffalo meat for eating, and he was among the first to supply Dodge City's Myers in Wrath with the first buffalo hides to ship east. He sent his brother in New York City, John Wrightmore, 57 hides to see what he could do with them. The brother sold the hides to a tanning firm, and they were very impressed and quickly ordered 2,000 more. The killing of buffalo for their hides for profit began in earnest after this sale. J. Wright Moore and another man named Steel Frazier checked with Colonel Richard Dodge, who was commander of the troops at Fort Dodge, to see if the Texas Panhandle was off limits. Dodge told them to hunt buffalo where the buffalo are. Now they were concerned because the Treaty of Medicine Lodge Creek had said that the area south of the Arkansas River was off limits. But Dodge said, go kill buffalo where you can kill them. So the Moore brothers scouted the Texas Panhandle in 1873 and established a hunting camp on the Canadian River from where they set out to kill buffalo despite dangerous encounters with hostile indigenous people. James Hamilton Cater and his brother were also testing the area and found success, as did others. And so we get to the Dodge City merchants and hunters like Billy Dixon and Bat Masterson and others who were attracted to the area and the Adobe Walls trading post was born again. Merchants and hunters in Dodge City decided to establish a supply center and a place to sell hides and resupply at the old Adobe Walls post. A.C. Myers was a leader in the plan and Billy Dixon led the merchants and hunters to the new settlement. As Bill Neely explains in his biography of Quanah Parker, German-born Charles Rath and his business partner, Robert M. Wright, decided to build a combination store and restaurant at Adobe Walls on a wide prairie that gradually sloped to a little creek and south to the Canadian River in the Texas Panhandle. As you know, this was the site of William Bent's old trading post from the 1840s that had been the site of the first Battle of Adobe Walls ten years before in 1864. Rath and several employees set out in late April 1874 and freighted about $20,000 worth of goods to the site. After arriving on May the 1st, the Rath and Company crew built a mostly sawed facility with a three-room store, corral, and outhouse. Rath left for Dodge City with most of his crew on May 20th when the building was nearly completed. In addition to Rath and Company's buildings, a number of log buildings were built and surrounded with an eight-foot-high corral fence made from cottonwood tree trunks that they had harvested from nearby creeks. As Bill Neely describes the setting, Myers and Leonard's store of picket construction was on the extreme north of the little cluster of buildings that had been raised on the windswept prairie. About 300 feet to the south was Hanrahan's saloon, made of adobe, as was Rath and Wright's store, just over 200 feet south of the saloon. In addition, there were O'Keefe's blacksmith shop and two outbuildings. So there were two stores, a blacksmith shop, and a saloon. And the location served as a place for buffalo hunters to sell their hides and have them shipped out and for them to stock up with supplies. Buffalo hunters like Billy Dixon came to kill the buffalo, and the place was an insult to the people. 
the words of Kiowa Chief Kicking Bird shares the attitude of the Plains Nations. He said, The buffalo is our money. It is our only resource with which to buy what we need and do not receive from the government the robes we can prepare in trade. We love them just as the white man does his money. Just as it makes a white man's heart feel to have his money carried away, so it makes us feel to see others killing and stealing our buffaloes, which are our cattle given to us by the Great Father above, to provide us meat to eat and means to get things to wear. And so, in retaliation, the people of the plains began to kill the killers of the buffalo wherever they found them. Which gets us back to Pero Coon, Esate, Quana, and the Comanches on Elk Creek in Indian Territory. Now, at first, Quana had wanted to wage a revenge raid against the Tonkawas, who had killed a close friend of his. He first visited the Noconi Band on Cash Creek and carried his pipe around to enlist warriors. He then traveled to visit the Kiowas and Guajada Comanches on Elk Creek. He visited more Comanches and Cheyennes camped on the Washita. And it is there the old man had advice for Quana, Otter Belt, White Wolf, and Pero Coom, who apparently hadn't fallen too ill by this point, advised that he first go against the buffalo hunters at Adobe Walls and then go kill in Texas. And Quana found a motivating ally in Esate. Now, Esate, or Esate, whose name has as many spellings as it does translations, I-S-A-T-A-I apostrophe I, I-S-A-T-A-I, and E-S-C-H-I-T-I, and translations like Rear End of a Wolf, Coyote Droppings, and some more colorful ones, was ready to take action. He and Quanta called a council at the junction of Elk Creek and the North Fork of the Red River for the Comanches, where they would do something that had never been done before by the Comanches, perform the sun dance that other Plains people already practice. Kiowas, Cheyennes, and Arapahoes came to the event. Now, Thomas Batty, a missionary and teacher, had this to say of Asate. This young medicine man makes bold pretensions. He claims that he has raised the dead to life. He is reported to have raised from his stomach nearly a wagon load of cartridges at one time, in the presence of several Comanches. He then swallowed them again, informing the Comanches that they need not fear the expenditure of ammunition in carrying on a war against the whites, as he can supply all their needs in that line. He can make medicine which will render it impossible for a Comanche to be killed, even though he stands just before the muzzle of the white man's guns. He ascends above the clouds, far beyond the sun, the home of the Great Spirit, with whom he has often conversed. Isate promised invincibility against the superior firepower of the buffalo hunters. Quan himself remembered some of what was going on as follows. He said, Esate, make big talk that time. Lots of white men. I stop the bullets in gun. Bullets not penetrate shirts. We kill them just like old women. God told me truth. Before that, pretty good medicine, Esate. He sit down, away, listen. God talk to him. Maybe so 50 miles over there, a little creek. I see soldiers. We go kill them. Pretty soon, truce. This time, he listened what God tell him. Zoe Tillman wrote of Esate's actions at Elk Creek, describing him as a young and vigorous man that did not wear a buffalo skull cap or ceremonial mask like many of the older medicine men. He stood up with only a breechcloth and moccasins on, with a wide sash of red cloth tied around his waist. And he had a red-tipped hawk's feather in his hair. Hanging from each ear was also a snake rattle. Now, I want to call back, and this is the problem with memory. Billy Dixon described him as an old prophet. He actually was a young man at this time. And Tillman went on to describe more. 
saying, Bending over the small fire, he laid upon it a handful of green cedar twigs, and in a moment the heavy pungent smoke rose thickly. With his feather fan, Isate spread and fanned it toward all in the circle. A companion, who sat just behind him, began to beat softly on a small drum. He leaned over the fire and washed his hands in the purifying smoke, bathed his face and breast with it. He sang a low chant, some of it mere syllables, but interspersed with words. Great Spirit, have pity on us. Great Spirit, make us strong. Essa, our brother, show us what to do. And Essate raised his arms upward and appealed. He called for the drum to stop and said, O chiefs and brothers, behold me. Essate, son of the wolf, my medicine is strong. My spirit left my body and went far away, up the path of the stars. I came to the place of the great spirit, the great father of the Indians, who is greater and higher than the white man's God. I was weary from the far journey. My feet could scarcely move, and my tongue was dry with thirst, and my belly thin with hunger. My moccasins were strings, and my robe could not keep out the terrible cold. But the great father said, Ho, here is a brave man and a strong warrior who could make this journey. A woman gave me food and drink. I was warm and happy. The great father talked with me. He said, I will take pity on the people. I will make them strong in war, and they shall drive all the white men away. The Caddos and Wichitas, tribes that dig in the ground and have made peace with the white men, they shall very soon pass away. There shall not be any of them left. Those Comanches and Kiowas and the others who stay on the reservation shall pass away just like them. Only the warriors shall be strong and increase. They shall hold all the land going where they please. The buffalo shall come back and everywhere so that there shall be feasting and plenty in the lodges. That is what he told me to tell the people, as the said. He told me how to make paint that will turn away bullets. My medicine is very strong. And Quana spoke up in the council in support of Esate. And then Esate howled like a wolf as he threw back his head. He then burned cedar again, and the smoke spread to the beat of the drum. Then he stood still, crossed his arms, and chanted, O great father, have pity, O great father, make us strong. Make our arrows swift, make our bows powerful, give us sharp lances, great father, have pity. And it was then claimed that three arrows appeared in his hands as he chanted, and then he said, These are medicine arrows sent by the great spirit. You saw them come to my hands out of the air. My brothers, the great father will give you power. You shall drive out the white men, and the great father will bring the buffalo back again. He has told me so when I was taken up to see him. And Esate promised that they would kill all the white men at Adobe Walls in their sleep. No harm would come to the warriors. And as we learned from Billy Dixon's account, this did not happen. Esate, riding a pony painted completely in yellow paint that would repel bullets, set out with Quana at the head of a party of 250 to 500 Comanche, Cheyenne, and Kiowa warriors. Now, this is where I need to point out, in Billy Dixon's account, he said something like the force was up to a 1,000. The Texas State Historical Association's Handbook of Texas repeatedly says there's a number of 700. Other accounts I've seen have been somewhere between 250 and 500. The problem is there was no census of the warriors or list of everybody that went. And in Billy Dixon's defense, it probably seemed like there were a thousand warriors outside the walls. Let's just say it was a sizable amount and move on. That's part of the problems also with memory is sometimes things aren't recalled exactly correct. So... Esate sets out with Quana with 
anywhere from 250 to 700 Comanche, Cheyenne, Kiowa warriors. And people like Stone Calf and Red Moon of the Cheyennes traveled with them, as did Kiowa leaders Lone Wolf and Woman's Heart. Sentante, White Horse, that we learned about in a previous episode, said by some to be the most dangerous man in the Kiowa Nation, he rode with them. Satanta, out on parole, also rode with them. It said that he did not participate, but it was only there to lend support, moral support, because it would be a violation of his parole to fight. Birdbow, White Shield, and Howling Wolf also traveled with the group. And as I said, there are often contradictory reports. Some say that Pero Coombe traveled with the war party, but it is unlikely because sometime during the council he had fallen ill with pneumonia. Spring was late in coming that year, and it was colder. And most of what we know about Pero Coombe, Bull Bear, came from his son Timbo, and he stated that he died while they were gone to attack the Buffalo Hunters, on June 27, 1874. As they travel across the northern panhandle of Texas, they killed a few Buffalo Hunters before gathering in the dark at a little creek near the trading post. One of the directions Isate had given the warriors is that they must not kill a skunk as they journeyed to attack. Now, this is kind of a strange rule since skunk meat apparently was enjoyed by the people of the Southern Plains. And later he learned after the battle that a group of Cheyenne warriors had indeed killed a skunk on the journey. Would he have called off the attack had he known beforehand? That's something we won't know. Now the plan was to catch the people of Adobe Walls asleep. It would be an easy kill. Unbeknownst to the warriors, many of the men at the trading post had been up most of the night trying to fix a beam in Hanrahan's saloon. Remember what Billy Dixon remembered? That after the fight, they could find no damage to the beam, though? Now, there's a chance that Hanrahan had been warned and had made up the broken beam to have the men awake and prepared. Better to pretend the beam was broken than wake up a bunch of drunk and very tired buffalo hunters that might get a little bit angry. But this is all still speculation. We don't really know other than what's been reported. But we do know this. News of the Warriors' plans had reached Camp Supply in Indian Territory, and the post traders Lee and Reynolds sent a warning to Charles Rath with a man named Amos Chapman, who was a government scout, and a few soldiers went with him. Rath must have returned to the trading post by this point in time, though, after having left the previous month. J. Wright Moore was also present. According to Bill Neely in his biography of Quanah Parker, which I highly recommend because he uses Native American sources for much of it, he said, After reaching Adobe Walls, Chapman conferred with the merchants on orders from those who chose to believe that the message was meant only for the owners or their senior employees. The news of the Indians' plans to attack the buffalo hunters was quickly circumscribed. The merchants were sure that they would lose their investment of time and money if the hunters got wind of an impending attack and left the region. Myers and Rath prudently chose not to stay at Adobe Walls and soon headed for Dodge, mounted on good horses. The Moore brothers, to whom Chapman did reveal the message, also headed north. And so, as the Moore brothers traveled north, they met the Shadler brothers and their dog, traveling towards Adobe Walls, and he warned them of the threat. But the Shadler brothers continued on. And the Moors also met a group of five buffalo hunters that included somebody named Billy Tyler. And they were headed to the safety of Adobe Walls. And they had already been attacked on the Cimarron just the day before. And they must have reached the post that day or the next. Because as Billy Dixon remembered the night before the attack on June 27th, 1874, he wrote... By this time, the excitement and talk about the fate of the four men who had been killed by Indians had subsided, and we paid no further attention to the matter. So busily were we engaged in our preparations for departure. Several hunters had come in that day, and we planned to stay up late that night celebrating our return to the range. 
telling stories of past experiences and joking about how much money we would have when the hunt was over. He continues, The night was sultry and we sat with open doors. In all the vast wilderness, ours were the only light save the stars that glittered above us. There was just a handful of us out there on the plains, each bound to the other by the common tie of standing together in the face of any danger that threatened us. It was a simple code, but the best I know of. Outside could be heard at intervals the muffled sounds of the stock moving and stumbling around or picketed horse shaking himself as he paused in his hunt for the young grass. In the timber along Adobe Walls Creek to the east, owls were hooting. We paid no attention to these things, however, and in our fancied security against all foes frolicked and had a general good time. Hanrahan did a thriving trade. And all that, the hand hand again was a saloon owner. Meanwhile, near the buildings, the warriors were readying themselves in a growth of cottonwood trees under the light of a full moon. Had having been warned, or even if they had been warned, the buffalo hunters did not seem very concerned, according to Dixon's memory. Then it was about 2 a.m. of June the 27th, 1874, a loud crack, like the report of a rifle, woke the men sleeping in Hanrahan's saloon. Some 15 men spent hours trying to repair the roof. It was a lucky event, or perhaps planned, because as Dixon recalled, providential things usually are mysterious. There has always been something mysterious to me in the loud report that came from that ridgepole in Hanrahan's saloon. It seems strange that it should have happened at the very time it did, instead of at noon or some other hour. And above all, that it should have been loud enough to wake the men who were fast asleep. Twenty-eight men and one woman would have been slaughtered if the ridgepole in Hanrahan Saloon had not cracked like a rifle shot. Dixon also commented that it had been told that the ridgepole broke. As a matter of fact, when it was examined afterward, it was sound and firm. Whatever the case, many of them were awake instead of sleeping in that morning once repairs had been made dawn was now close at hand and Hanrahan suggested to Dixon that they get an early start with hunting and Dixon agreed Dixon had made an arrangement to team up with Hanrahan because he could kill enough buffalo in a day to keep many many more men than he had busy skinning them and some of the others went back to sleep now, as I said, the afternoon before, unbeknownst to the buffalo hunters, Asate, Quana, and the warriors had arrived near the trading post, and Quana described the event for us. He said that they put their saddles and blankets in trees and hobbled their extra ponies before making medicine, painting their faces, and putting on war bonnets. Then they traveled even closer until they were close to a red hill near a little creek near the post. Some slept, others smoked. Near morning, light, they formed a line and slowly moved closer until the order to charge was given. Uh, about this time, the Billy Dixon had sent Billy Og, his helper, to fetch the horses from the creek. Dixon remembered the following. Turning to my bed, I rolled it up and threw it on the front of my wagon. As I turned to pick up my gun, which lay on the ground, I looked in the direction of our horses, they were in sight. Something else caught my eye. Just beyond the horses, at the edge of some timber, was a large body of objects advancing vaguely in the dusky dawn toward our stock and in the direction of adobe walls. Though keen of vision, I could not make out what the objects were, even by straining my eyes. Then I was thunderstruck. The black body of moving objects suddenly spread out like a fan, and from it went up one single solid yell, a war whoop, that seemed to shake the very air of the early morning. Then came the thudding roar of running horses and the hideous cries of the individual warriors, each embarked in the onslaught. I could see that hundreds of Indians were coming. Had it not been for the ridgepole, all of us would have been asleep. Quana remembered that the charging horsemen made a high cloud of dust as they rushed towards the adobe walls trading post. Dixon adds more to the vivid picture of the attack. 
There was never a more splendid barbaric sight, and after years I was glad that I had seen it. Hundreds of warriors, the flower of the fighting men of the southwestern plains tribes, mounted upon their finest horses, armed with guns and lances, and carrying heavy shields of thick buffalo hide, were coming like the wind. Over all was splashed the rich colors of red, vermilion, and ochre, on the bodies of the men, on the bodies of the running horses. Scalps dangled from bridles, gorgeous war bonnets fluttered their plumes, bright feathers dangled from the tails and manes of the horses, and the bronzed half-naked bodies of the riders glittered with ornaments of silver and brass. Behind this headlong charging hose stretched the plains, on whose horizon the rising sun was lifting its morning fires. The warriors seemed to emerge from this glowing background. It must have been quite a fearful sight to see. Now, some of the attackers immediately tried to capture and drive away the horses, while Quana and many others rode on. He was in the middle and went to the buildings. He wanted to breach the buildings. As he went in to the settlement, Quana lanced one of the Shadler brothers who had been sleeping in their wagon. The warriors quickly killed the other brother and the dog. All three were scalped. As Bill Neely wrote of the incident, thus was partially fulfilled Esate's promise of killing the white men in their beds. But the other whites were now very much awake, and further scalps would be hard to come by. Quana got on a building and tried to poke holes through the saw to shoot. He remembered that the buffalo hunter's big guns, however, were very effective and did quite a bit of damage. Quana ordered repeated attacks on the buildings, but the attackers' casualties were heavy, and they kept having to withdraw and regroup. The warriors were showing to not be bulletproof, and Quana himself often led the charges. Once he tried to break open a door of a building by backing his horse hard against it, but he failed and avoided getting shot. The attacks continued until about noon, killing another man. The attackers had killed Billy Tyler when he tried to aid the distressed animals in the corral near Myers and Leonard's store. A fourth defender, if you remember from Billy Dixon's memories, Mr. Olds later accidentally killed himself by the accidental discharge of his own gun. Under heavy fire in front of Rath's store, Quano rescued a Comanche comrade named ho wei -ha. But things weren't going that well for the attackers, and then started getting worse. A bullet penetrated Quana's shield of medicine paint that Isate had readied for him. Billy Dixon's memories contribute here. Time and again, with the fury of a whirlwind, the Indians charged upon the building, only to sustain greater losses than they were able to inflict. This was a losing game, and if the Indians kept it up, we stood a fair chance of killing most of them. I'm sure we surprised the Indians as badly as they surprised us. They expected to find us asleep, unprepared for an attack. Their medicine man had told them that all they would have to do would be to come to adobe walls and knock us on the head with sticks, and that our bullets would not be strong enough to break an Indian's skin. On another charge, Quana's horse was shot out from under him. Thrown from the horse, he sought cover behind a buffalo carcass or a stack of buffalo hides. A bullet hit the buffalo powder horn swinging from his shoulder and the bullet deflected and hit him in the side. The horn most likely saved Quana's life. Wounded, he crawled to a plum thicket where he remained until a mounted warrior scooped him up off the ground and took him to safety. Now, Quana, the war leader, his injury slowed the intensity of the attack and the charges ended about noon. After that, the warriors just started circling the buildings and firing. Now, the older chiefs that had not been involved in the attack, they held a council to find out who had shot Quana, but none of the warriors admitted to shooting their leader. How could he have been hit? By mid-afternoon, the warriors circled wider and wider as the buffalo guns kept threatening them with their long range. And about four o'clock in the afternoon, things had calmed down enough to where Dixon and some of the other men took a chance and traveled outside the buildings. They gathered up some mementos from the fight and 
found that the attackers had killed or driven away all of their horses. They were stranded on foot. Things slowed down a little bit. The attackers, having pulled back, driven away by the heavy firing buffalo guns, the defenders took time then to bury the Shadler brothers and Billy Tyler. And then they cut the heads off the dead warriors that were laying nearby. And they placed them in stakes around adobe walls. And they dragged the headless bodies away from the buildings on buffalo robes. And then did the same with several dead horses. And they ended up burying 12 dead animals in just a pile. The next day, the defenders saw several warriors appear on a bluff across the valley east of the trading post. They fired at them, and the warriors disappeared. And Dixon remembers this time period as being very, pretty gloomy. With every horse dead or captured, we felt pretty sore all around. The Indians were somewhere close at hand, watching our every movement. We were depressed with the melancholy feeling that probably all the hunters out in the camps had been killed. Late that afternoon, our spirits leaped when we saw a team coming up the valley from the direction of the Canadian. Buffalo hunters, including Jim and Bob Cater, were starting to arrive to help in the defense. And that day, they decided they were going to try to send a rider to Dodge for help. The attackers also held a council on the second day. And they really wanted to know why had the attack failed. Esate blamed the failure on the fact that some Cheyennes had killed a skunk. Tillman explained the following. The council was assembled on a lower slope with the crest of the ridge between them and the fort. Out of sight. As they considered too far for effective gunfire, even if on a level. The pony of Isate, wearing the protective painting that its owner declared would ward off arrows or bullets, stood by. Suddenly, its head jerked. It staggered and fell, blood oozing from a hole in its forehead. In a moment, it was dead. The mark of the heavy buffalo slug was unmistakable. The pony had been killed by a shot from the plainsman's guns coming over the hill. Now this was the end of the power of Esate as a prophet. That night, small groups of warriors began to depart. On the third day, the attackers held another council, and after it, Quanah, Stonecalf, White Shield, and about 20 other warriors rode to the top of the butte beyond East Adobe Walls Creek. The defenders saw them, and this is when Billy Dixon made his famous shot. As Dixon remembered, some of the boys suggested that I try my big 50 on them. The distance was not far from three quarters of a mile. A number of exaggerated accounts have been written about this incident. I took careful aim and pulled the trigger. We saw an Indian fall from his horse. The others dashed out of sight behind a clump of timber. Now, much later, a Comanche named ko hai remembered the battle in Dixon's shot but he did not mention Esate or the medicine. He summed it up like this. We lost the fight. The buffalo hunters were too much for us. They stood behind adobe walls. They had telescopes on their guns. Sometimes we would be standing way off, resting and hardly thinking of the fight, and they would kill our horses. One of our men was knocked off his horse by a spent bullet fired at a range of about a mile. It stunned, but did not kill him. All in all, the warriors had lost about 15 to 30 to death. Estimates vary. Most, most of what I've seen say closer to 13 or 15 dead. Many, many more had been wounded. And that was the end. Word spread, and other buffalo hunters came to the rescue. By the fifth day... When the Plains attackers withdrew from the fight entirely, there were more than 100 defenders at Adobe Walls. As Quana put it, pretty soon all go back, get saddles and bridles, and go to village. I take all young men, go warpath to Texas. And it was this event, the second battle of Adobe Walls, led by two young men fighting for freedom in a way of life that was vanishing 
They waged it as an older leader who had priest resistance died of pneumonia on Elk Creek. And this event proved to be the final deciding factor in their future. The peace policy was over. After this and a number of other events that had happened in previous years. This was the end. Now it would be time for a brutal, brutal war. Not long after the Second Battle of Adobe Walls, the United States military launched the Red River War of 1874 to 1875. The campaign which destroyed the Plains people's horse herds, their wealth, and their pursuit across the plains into Palo Duro Canyon was a campaign of attrition and death. It led to the Plains tribes settling on their reservations near Fort Sill in Indian Territory. The slaughter of the buffalo would continue, and cattlemen like Charles Goodnight would replace them with cattle. It was not the end of the tale of Quana or Esete, however. Now, the battle was really where Quana first gained notice by his enemies as a leader, and this was really the beginning of decades in which Quana would play an important role in the history of his people and of the West. And Esete, though viewed later as a comical fellow by the people, He'd be present there, too, causing some problems for Quana. And there's more to the story of Billy Dixon and many of the other people named here. But those are stories for another day. That's going to do it for us today. Thank you for listening. Let's take a quick break before we come back and have some closing comments and wrap up the show. I want to thank Patreon supporters for supporting the show. I want to thank people that click on that link in the show notes and buy me a cup of coffee. It is appreciated. So that does it. That's a summary. That's a more in-depth look at the Second Battle of Adobe Walls. It just opens up more questions personally for me that I'm going to try to pursue and dig deeper into little tangent stories someday in the future. Hope you're enjoying it. Uh, Thanks for listening again. I'd like to remind you that the theme music is, of course, by the great Derek McClendon, Walking Through History. Be sure to check out his songs everywhere especially his most recent album that's amazing, Interstate Daydreamer. I want to remind you that Zach Welch has a new single out, Drunken Ramblings, of Hopeless Romantic. Also, Kate Anson, who I've played before on the podcast, has a new album out, Coyotes and Matches, which is filled with some great songs. Go check that out wherever you listen to your music. And we're going to end the episode with a song by Cade from his new album, Coyotes and Matches. And this song is Highline Wild Horses. Thanks again for listening. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Be kind. Adios. Whose hands were callous from a long life on the range. Yeah, he taught me about life and he taught me how to drink Just some old timer living in an older town That was built up from its railways and its dark fertile ground From a young age he's been living off this land He said what's a boy to do once he makes it back from Vietnam I had four different women that I promised for forever But each love ran dry Once the water left bare river and his spurs hit the stool as he took a shot of whiskey Well he sat his glass down and then he looked at me He said Highline wild horses and a rambling man's ways Are the two things you don't dare try and change well, one is never destined to be broken While the other's never meant to be t-
tame Well, I line wild horses In a rambling man's ways Well, from a young age These boats were meant to roam Now they're worn down at the seams And they're tearing at the soles But I'll still hang my hat as I shoot out the rising sun Said, boy, some things in life sunk Men just can't outrun Like high-line wild horses In a rambling man's ways Are the two things you don't dare try and change Well, one is never destined to be broken While the other is never meant to be tamed Well, I line wild horses in a rambling man's ways Are the two things you don't dare try and change